absence of 1201A1, illegal access to wireless networks is already just that, illegal. A 1201A1 exemption affects only the legality or illegality of a particular activity with respect to 1201A1. It does not render an activity that is illegal under some other law legal. So now I've talked at length about why the benefit to carriers of striking down the unlocking exemption would be minimal at best. My colleague, Carl Desai, will speak in just a moment about the enormous adverse effects that consumers would suffer if the unlocking exemption were not removed. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Sun. Good morning, and thank you for having me um, appear today. Again, my name is Carl Desai, I'm Communications Policy Counsel for, for Consumers Union, which is the policy and advocacy decision of this policy and advocacy division of Consumer Reports Magazine. Uh, Laura gave you some great uh, background on why we think this is important. This is an issue that's important for our organization. Mobile device unlocking, we believe, is a practical and widespread activity performed by countless users of mobile device firmware and software. Without continuing the 1201A1 exemption covering unlocking, this valuable activity would be chilled under the anti-circumvention provision. If the Register of Copyrights declines to extend that exemption for another three years, users of mobile device firmware and software are likely to be adversely affected by 1201A1 in their ability to unlock their mobile devices, which is a non-infringing use. Thus, Consumers Union strongly urges the register to continue the exemption. One reason to continue the exemption is because the marketplace is not a friendly marketplace to consumers who wish to switch carriers. There are a number of barriers to switching but one barrier is that wireless providers use software locks primarily to hamper a customer's ability to switch to a competitor service, net service network. In the words of the register, in the context of subsidy protection, quote, it is apparent that the main function of the software lock is to support a business model, and the purpose of this rulemaking is not to protect such an interest or to maintain the profitability of a particular corporation or industry. So not only will the exemption not only would the exemption promote consumer choice, consumers also themselves value portability. Mobile device portability is central to competition in the mobile marketplace. As mobile communications become more integral to consumers' lives, consumers need confidence that the devices will work, regardless of the carrier or network. Without portability, consumers might be locked into a particular carrier for all the wrong reasons. Competition will be undermined, which would ultimately harm consumers by reducing consumer choice. As the Federal Communications Commission has noted, quote, if enough consumers have the ability and propensity to switch service providers in response to a change in price or non-price factors, then mobile wireless service providers will have an incentive to compete vigorously to gain customers and retain their current customers. And consumers recognize the importance of interoperability, and they demand the ability to use their mobile devices across networks. 97% of respondents in the nationwide poll conducted at Consumers Union expressed that consumers should be able to keep their existing handsets when changing carriers, while 59% stated that they would actually like to take their existing devices with them to another carrier. A staggering 88% said their handsets should work on any cellular network. The ability to unlock a used device for operation on a non-native network is particularly important for low-income consumers who may not be able to afford the hefty price tag on a brand new mobile device, or they may not qualify for the credit-based post-paid service plans that offer devices for low or zero subsidized upfront costs, which customers then pay off later through monthly fees. Although cheap phones are often, are often offered with prepaid service plans, these phones tend to be very basic devices that lack the innovative features of cutting-edge smartphones. Consequently, this leaves low-income consumers who want smartphones comparable to their higher-income counterparts out of luck. These consumers could be served by a robust second-hand market for such devices. Not only do consumers value this ability, but they actually use this ability to unlock their devices and take them with them from one provider to another. Take the example that Laura provided just a few minutes ago regarding her own experience. We also Pulled additional examples from email messages sent over the Bethesda Chevy Chase FreeCycle listserv over the past several months. FreeCycle is a listserv open to 
anyone in the area who would prefer to recycle, typically by giving away to someone else on the list a used item rather than throw it away. Participants give and take furniture, paints, plants, toys, clothing, pretty much anything you can think of. Back in August, someone posted a message looking for a used phone that her sister-in-law would be able to carry, looking for a used phone that her sister-in-law would be able to carry as an emergency contact number for her kids at school. Someone else was looking for a working phone because she had borrowed her mom's phone and accidentally left it in her pocket when she went swimming in the ocean. This poster notified the list three days later that she had received the phone. Thank you to everyone who responded, she wrote. That was on September 5th. By our count, six then, since then, there have been additional 16 messages circulated over the, uh, the Chevy Chase Recycle Lister, list of either offering or soliciting working used mobile devices. For example, two posters asked to adopt someone's used iPhone due to budgetary constraints. I'll need one and can't afford it, so I'll take what I can get from the poster. So as you can see, consumers find the ability to unlock and reuse secondhand mobile devices, both valuable and useful. And although some carriers are willing, under some circumstances, to unlock their, cons their customers' devices, there are many circumstances under which carriers are not willing to unlock their customers' devices. In connection with this proceeding, we've inspected the publicly available unlocking policies of AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon Wireless, and identified a number of strict limitations to those policies. For example, AT&T and T-Mobile will help some of their customers unlock their devices to their networks, but only if the unlocking is requested by an individual who is a current or at least a past customer of the company. This means that in the case of a consumer who receives a used device free or at low cost, that is, up, that is locked to another carrier, as Laura explained she did in 2003. As far as we can tell, it is not possible to get the carrier to which the device is locked to provide the unlocking service. It is particularly difficult to get a carrier to unlock certain kinds of devices, including iPhones. AT&T considers iPhones and other certain devices, which in an undefined category, not eligible to be unlocked. Sprint will unlock the micro SIM slot on its iPhone 4S for subscribers who have been in good standing for 90 days or more, but the unlocked device will only accept an international SIM card, not one from a non-Sprint US carrier such as at and Verizon states that the iPhone 4 is configured only with the wireless service of Verizon Wireless and may not work on another carrier's network, even after completion of the contract term. Nor can consumers always purchase an already unlocked device, even from a retail outlet like Best Buy. As investigative attorney and physical security specialist Mark Weber Tobias explained in a blog post for Forbes last December, even a new iPhone 4S purchased from Best Buy at the unsubsidized price of $800 for use on the Verizon network can never be fully unlocked to be used on, on multiple carriers within the US. And despite having the hardware capacity to function on any GSM or CDMA network, even a so-called unlocked iPhone 4S purchased directly from Apple shift with the ability to connect to GSM networks only. Because many devices cannot be purchased completely unlocked, and carriers often will not unlock devices to their networks, consumers <coughs> who are looking for other options in purchasing devices are often left with no choice but to do the unlocking themselves. Thus, this allows individual consumers to unlock their own devices who have clear adverse effects that would extend beyond the mere hassle of consumers having to ask their carriers to help them do something they could oftentimes accomplish on their own. Finally, as we have argued in our proposed vote and comments, an unlocking exemption to telephone handsets would be under-inclusive and cause unnecessary consumer confusion. The relatively basic telephone handsets of several years ago have evolved into a variety of dynamic multi-purpose devices. Although the term telephone handset at the time of coinage had a clear meaning, technological advances have rendered it all but obsolete. It no longer refers to a distinct and meaningful category of devices. It would thus be more in line with the current technology and consumer expectations to define the exemption in terms of mobile devices. Thank you for your time this morning. And I'll be happy to answer questions if you have. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Stephen K. Berry. I'm the president and CEO of RCA, the Competitive Carriers Association. RCA is an association representing more than 100 competitive wireless providers 
uh, most of whom uh, of which serve fewer than 500,000 customers. RCA has a keen interest in ensuring that all customers, not merely those served by AT&T and Verizon, can take advantage of cutting edge handsets and wireless devices available today. The current exemption to the circumvention of copyright provision systems, which allows customers to unlock their wireless device to use on different networks, has, uh, has proven very popular with consumers and promotes consumer choice. Now let me identify a few items. Uh, the exemption is a pro-consumer, pro-competition policy decision. With the existence of exclusive handset arrangements by the largest wireless carriers, many RCA members continue to find it difficult to gain access to the newest handsets their customers want. Absent the exemption, consumer costs to unlock devices will increase if consumers are able to unlock their devices at, at, at all. Uh, artificial device locking merely protects the business model of certain wireless carriers and doesn't really protect a copyright interest. Two, the benefits to consumers of an unlocking exemption far outweigh the potential harm to copyright holders. Without the exemptions, consumers' fair use uh, of content will diminish, or consumers may even lose uh, content which they have already paid. Um, three, the social benefits are untold. The opportunity to donate unlocked devices to cell phones for soldiers, battered women's shelters, low income, underprivileged, or disabled communities are all potential benefits of unlocked wireless devices. These are all positive social benefit opportunities that should not be foreclosed. Four, the environmental impact is positive and undeniable, extending the useful life of a wireless device. Five, again, there is a significant pro-competitive benefit to all consumers when there are more wireless choices. So accordingly, RCA strongly supports extending, with slight modifications, the current exemption allowing consumers to unlock their wireless devices and associate those devices with the wireless network of their choosing. The modifications RCA proposes to the exemption are intended to ensure that it, it covers the full range of wireless devices, data, and networks used by consumers today in this dynamic wireless communications mar marketplace, and to ensure clarity of the exemption purpose as technology evolves. In July 2010, the Librarian of Congress, acting on the recommendation of the Registrar of Copyrights, issued an order adopting several exemptions from Section 1201A1A of the Copyright Act, which prohibits the circumvention of technological access controls protecting copyrighted works. One of those exemptions clarified that consumers may actually circumvent the access controls related to the following class of works, and that class of works is, as partly stated earlier, computer programs, in the form of firmware and software that enable used wireless telephones, telephone handsets to connect to a wireless telecommunications network when circumvention is initiated by the owner of a copy of the program solely in order to connect to a wireless telecommunications network and access to the network is authorized by the operator of the network. In adopting this exemption, which had appeared uh, in a slightly different form in 2006 order, the librarian permitted consumers to unlock handsets they purchased from wireless carriers or their authorized dealers in order to use in other carriers' networks. The exemption thus allows, for instance, an AT&T customer to switch to another carrier while keeping the handset he or she purchased from AT&T. Uh, it would also uh, provide a customer the opportunity to switch to AT&T using a handset they bought from T-Mobile if AT&T had a pro-consumer uh, current unlocking exemption policy. As with other exemptions adopted in the order, this current uh, uh, unlocking exemption would apply for three years. The unlocking exemption was clearly justified and well documented in 2010, and the Copyright Office should <coughs> recommend extending the unlocking exemption with some slight modifications for another three years. The renewal of the current exemption in 2010 was a profoundly positive development for competition and consumers, allowing wireless users across the country to switch providers while retaining their wireless devices. Those consumer benefits will continue if the exemption is extended. Unlocking is particularly important for rural, regional, and smaller carriers that lack the scope and scale to gain access to the latest 
most iconic devices directly from the equipment manufacturers, which in turn prevents millions of consumers from accessing the latest devices. Conversely, a failure to extend the exemption would have a substantial adverse effect on non-infringing uses of wireless devices and their associated firmware, software, and data. The Copyright Office recommendation and the librarian's previous decision to approve and extend the exemption are precedential. The previous detailed, well-reasoned decision to continue the exemption was not only well-documented with sound analytical basis, but should be precedent-setting. In fact, absent a significant change in the circumstances, given the harmful effects of allowing and unlocking the exemption to expire, the Copyright Office should adopt the presumption that the exemption remains valid. Opponents of the exemption should have to prove otherwise. Such an approach would be consistent with the Copyright Act and would minimize uncertainty for users of the wireless devices for the future. Indeed, the Registrar has found that where similar facts are presented, as here, the Registrar is likely to reach a similar conclusion with respect to the renewal of a particular exemption. Finally, in extending the unlocking exemption, the Copyright Office should slightly modify the wording to clarify types of works the exemption covers <clears throat> to ensure that the exemption keeps pace with ongoing technological innovation and clarify the purpose of the exemption. This will ensure consumers will reap the full intended benefits of the exception and those opposed to the exception could not easily frustrate its implementation. We urge the Copyright Office uh, to include exemption language uh, of data used in the programs to identify the other networks that it would connect to. And also that wireless devices, such as smartphones, tablets, and other devices are intended to be within the exemption, not just wireless telephone handsets. I also urge the Copyright Office to modify the wireless telecommunications network provision to wireless communications network in the exemption language to more accurately reflect current and future technologies in the wireless marketplace. I commend you for your previous decisions in this regard. I thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of all the competitive carriers in the United States, urging your continued support for pro-consumer, pro-competition policies by specifically extending the unlocking provision from Section 1201A1A of the Copyright Act. Thank you, and I'll be more happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Good morning, distinguished panelists. My name is Bruce Joseph. I'm here on behalf of CTIA, the Wireless Association, an association that broadly represents all sectors of the wireless communications industry. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today to oppose the requested exemptions in Class 6. Our written comments and our reply comments discuss at length why this class versions of this class should be denied. In my oral statement today, I would like to focus on three points uh, that are central in this proceeding. One, the proponents have failed to meet their burden of demonstrating the requisite harm from the prohibition on the circumvention of cell phone network locks. Two, the proponents have failed to prove that the harm that they assert relates to any non-infringing use that they claim is being interfered with. As the register has made clear, for example, in the 2010 recommendation at page 10, this is a distinct question from harm. You must show both significant harm and that it is to a non-infringing use. And three, beyond the fact that there is no justification for the requested class in any form, there certainly is no justification for expanding the class beyond that approved in 2010. The proponents have failed to carry the burden of proving that the expansions that they seek are required to prevent substantial harm to any non-infringing use. Indeed, the register reviewed and previously rejected many of the same requests <coughs> in the past, and there has been no greater showing of need here. Let's start with harm. The proponents bear the threshold burden of proving that the prohibition on circumvention is causing substantial harm. That's out of the register's recommendation, page 10. Here, proponents have made no showing of an 
adverse effect on any use of a copyrighted work that is properly within the scope of this proceeding, much less a highly specific and strong showing of the distinct, verifiable, and measurable adverse effects that is the standard that applies here. That comes from the registered recommendations in the past and the House Manager's Report on the legislation. Arguments and unsupported statements and comments or testimony are not evidence, and they don't become evidence simply because they are repeated and cited by another commenter. Further, selected anecdotal examples should be, be viewed with skepticism and should not be seen to constitute evidence of substantial or widespread <coughs> adverse effect. I note that there was a reference to isolated emails today that are not in the record and that for which there has been no opportunity to review them or respond to them. The existence of the 2010 exemption does not change this burden. Each triennial proceeding is to be conducted de novo. As the Register said in 2010, the fact that a class was previously designated, and I quote, creates no presumption that redesignation is appropriate, but rather the proponent of such a class must make a prima facie case in each three-year period. Moreover, the demonstrated harm must be due to a prohibition on circumvention. Again, in the words of the Register, adverse impacts that are the results of factors other than the prohibition are not within the scope of this rulemaking. I was struck by Ms. Moy's testimony. Uh, her circumvention occurred in apparently 2002 or 2003, as she dates herself. She was clearly not deterred or harmed by any prohibition on circumvention under Section 1201. So that story shows no harm from the prohibition on circumvention. I was also struck that none of the commenters have done anything to distinguish the effects of any prohibition on circumvention or indeed network locks from the effects that the FCC identified in the reports that I believe consumer unions, consumers unions cited uh, that prevents using phones on different networks uh, in many cases, including the use of different technologies, CDMA versus GSM, the use of different bands even among GSM carriers, the optimization of the phone for different purposes. No evidence in the record differentiates the effect of a lock from all of these other effects. And again, the burden is on the proponents. Now the harm asserted, but not proven by proponents here, is that a user is prevented from using a cell phone's operating system, and thus the phone, on a network other than the network to which the phone is locked. But again, as I've said, proponents have prevented no presented no evidence that consumers are suffering significant harm as a result of a network lock or the prohibition. At most, proponents have cited some information to the effect that some people want to unlock phones, and in some cases are doing so. I know the misregard, by the way, that the consumers union union poll that's cited is not in the record, and there's no ability to test the validity of its conclusions or whether the questions were asked in a reasonable manner. But more importantly, the desire to circumvent a technological protection measure that's protected by Section 1211 is not evidence of harm. If that were the case, the widespread prevalence of DCSS and the widespread use of DCSS would support broad exemptions for unlocking DVDs, which the Register has consistently rejected. And indeed, thinking logically, it would be absurd if the prohibition on circumvention protected only locks that nobody wanted to circumvent, to be no point. Moreover, even the asserted harm is not properly cognizable for two reasons. First, we hear a lot about consumer choice here from the other side. But the decision to purchase a locked cell phone is entirely the choice of the consumer. It's a choice that is made because a locked phone comes with certain benefits, most commonly a substantially reduced price. In this record, even more than in the past, CTIA has demonstrated that there is an enormous selection of unlocked phones that are freely available, both from wireless service providers 
and from retail sellers. And I cite our exhibits A and B. Now, that selection is growing. In late April, and this was publicly announced, Google announced that it was selling unlocked Android phones through its online store. Again, increasing the availability of lawful unlocked phones. Fundamentally, when a consumer freely chooses to purchase a locked phone, it is unreasonable to claim that that lock is hurting the consumer. The lock is part and parcel of the deal the consumer made. That is not harm. There's no right in the law to have it both ways. Any allegedly adverse effect is the direct result of the consumer's own choice. And as the register has repeatedly held, adverse impacts that are the result of factors other than the prohibition are not within the scope of this rulemaking. Second, the asserted harm is not substantial. It is easily cured and is merely an issue of convenience or small incremental cost, two types of alleged harm that the register has consistently and explicitly rejected as justifying a Section 1201 exemption. As the record demonstrates, unlocked phones are widely available wholly independent of the existing exemption, and carriers regularly unlock phones. Contrary to Mr. Sai's testimony, AT&T announced in early April that it would unlock its iPhone for bona fide customers following a term commitment and for those who bought phones without a term commitment. Indeed, the register's treatment of the harm issue in connection with the 2010 cell phone unlocking exemption stands in dramatic and unsustainable contrast to the register's treatment of asserted harms in rejecting previously proposed exemptions for the circumvention of CSS on DVDs and certain streaming the register described as a recurring theme, recurring theme, the desire on the part of some participants to be able to gain access to protected digital works on platforms of their choosing rather than on platforms offered by content providers. In the register's words, which should apply here, Section 1201A1C was not intended to provide relief to consumers who are unhappy with the commercial terms on which copyright owners make their works available or the platforms on which they choose to distribute their works. The register found there was not cognizable harm where the user could access the content in regular, readily, readily available alternative ways or could purchase the works in alternative formats. In that case, the need for an exemption simply becomes a matter of convenience or preference. Here, the network is analogous to a platform. In a great many cases, the same phone operating system is available for use on different networks. Moreover, the same works are typically available in unlocked form. As the register found, also, it is not the purpose of this rulemaking to provide consumers with the most cost-effective means to obtain access to copyrighted works when there are reasonably priced alternatives. Indeed, the alternatives identified by the register in the DVD context, buying a separate DVD player, buying a new operating system for their computer, or indeed even buying a new computer, and those are at the register's recommendations of pages 222 and 224, those options are often substantially more costly than the cost of obtaining a new cell phone that is compatible with the new network of choice. Applying these, consist these criteria consistently, as you as an agency are obligated to do, there is no meaningful difference between a cell phone owner who wants to use a phone's operating system on a different network platform that's not authorized and one who wants to view video content on a video platform that is not authorized. Indeed, I have heard complaints that the cell phone locks are to protect business models, but I challenge the proponents to distinguish the region coding, for example, on DVDs as existing to protect anything other than a particular business model. Moreover, I've been struck by the fact that the other side has consistently said that cell phone locks are only to protect business models, not copyright interests, but I haven't heard copyright interests identified on the proponent's side. And remember, proponents bear the burden of demonstrating harm to a non-infringing use of copyrighted work in this proceeding. So let's turn to that second point I was going to address, non-infringing use. Proponents have 
opponents have presented no evidence that the circumvention they seek to support is to avoid harm to a non-infringing use of a phone's operating system. First, their focus on whether the act of circumvention itself is infringing is misplaced. The primary issue here relates to the not, the primary issue relating to non-infringing use is whether the unauthorized use of the unlocked work, the unlocked software, is non-infringing. Now, to be sure, it is true that if unlocking requires infringement, such as modifying iPhone software, which is typically how iPhones are unlocked, or modifying the track from a proprietary engine, there can't be an exemption because it's not non-infringing. But the converse isn't true. The use of the unlocked software must also be infringing. Now, as Consumers Union admits, no proponent has demonstrated, or for that matter, even argued, that the use of the protected software is fair use. So fair use is not an issue here. To quote CU, Consumers Union, CTIA correctly observes that not one of the proponents even attempted to justify the proposed unlocking activities as a fair use under the Copyright Act. So let's take fair use off the table. Third, proponents, or second, proponents have not carried the burden of showing that Section 117 authorizes the use of the software that they seek. Because, among other reasons, they have not shown that consumers own the copy of the software that they seek to use. The proponents need cite no evidence to prove ownership. The register in the prior proceeding recognized that the issue of ownership versus license of software is a nuanced question that depends on more than the question of whether somebody owns the material object in which the software is embedded. The terms of the applicable agreement must be considered. That same thought was reinforced by the recent decision in Apple versus Systar out of the Ninth Circuit, which observed that software licensing agreements, rather than sales, have become ubiquitous because they enable the licensor to control the use of the copyrighted material. But despite the recognized importance of the underlying agreements pursuant to which the software is distributed, not one proponent has cited to any agreement by any carrier that sells copies of its software. For that reason alone, proponents have failed to carry their burden of proof. That failure is particularly acute here, where CTIA has demonstrated that the agreements of record, including the agreements of all four large wire, of the four largest wireless carriers, all expressly license rather than sell the software. And at least three of the four expressly limit its use to authorized uses and prohibit a wide array of unauthorized uses and prohibit transfer or redistribution of the software. Indeed, at least three, AT&T, Verizon Wireless, and T-Mobile, expressly retain the right to change the software on the device, another clear indication that the carrier owns the copy, not the user. Virgin Mobile's licenses are to the same effect, retaining ownership, licensing it, limiting its use, prohibiting distribution, and retaining the right to modify the software remotely and without notice, and providing that unauthorized use terminates the license and your continued use will constitute copyright infringement. AT&T, T-Mobile, Virgin Mobile, and Sprint all limit authorized use of the software, all limit use to authorized use in connection with the carrier's service. Now, with respect, the register in 2010 impermissibly eviscerated the regulatory burden of proof when she shifted that burden to opponents because she presumed that absent other evidence because the user owns the phone, he or she owns the software. That shifting is inconsistent with the facts of record, and it is inconsistent with the register's own recognition of how software typically is licensed and distributed, and with the court's recognition in Apple versus Systar, which is an intervening decision, that licensing rather than sales are ubiquitous. Now, briefly addressing the copyright misuse argument that I believe Consumers Union makes, it may also come from Metro PCS, the Ninth Circuit in Systar made clear that that doctrine is to be applied sparingly, and the main point that easily dispatches with that argument is that limitations on the use of the copyrighted work itself is not misuse. Rather, in the words of the court, such limitations are firmly rooted in the history of copyright law, and that is all we're talking about here. Now, 
with respect to my third point, there has been no showing of supporting any expansion of the class. As weak as the supporting evidence is for the classes adopted in 2010, proponents have induced no evidence supporting that expansion. <coughs> Certainly nothing highly specific and strong showing distinct, verifiable, and measurable adverse effect of any of the limitations that they now seek to remove. In addition, regarding the request to extend the exemption to used cell phones, two of the four proponents are wholly silent on that. They just assert that it should be. Uh, RCA offers only argument, no evidence, and the only stated justification from Consumers Union is so that subscribers can get a new subsidized phone when it's offered by a carrier, unlock it, and sell it. That is starkly different from the asserted desire to foster the uh, use of a phone on the network of the consumer's choice. Uh, by the way, that limitation was not included in 2010 by the register to ensure that, that the 1201 exemption did not foster in any way illicit bulk reselling, which the register found would be a serious matter that adversely affects the marketplace and consumers. And I have been informed that the register's clear statements against bulk reselling have been very helpful in efforts to stop that practice. We would urge their inclusion again if the register recommends an exemption, which of course we would hope that the register would not. With regard to extend the exemption to devices other than cell phones and to networks other than telecommunications networks, there is no evidence presented that consumers are harmed by any locks that may exist that haven't been shown to exist on data-oriented devices such as tablets, that the harm is substantial, or that they are tied to any non-infringing use. In addition, the effort to expand the exemption to persons other than the owner of the copy and for the purpose other than connection uh, to a network would eliminate any possible reliance on Section 117 to the extent that's valid, and we argue, as you know, we believe it's not, and further would foster bulk reselling and commercial circumvention services, both of which should not be encouraged by the register in this proceeding. In conclusion, I think I've said it too many times, the proponents have not carried their burden and no exemption has been justified on the record in this proceeding. However, the proponents' primary arguments are based on the alleged interests of consumers, individual consumers, who want to use their phones on the network of choice, on their network and CTIA members do not foresee a situation in which they would sue a bona fide individual customer who circumvented a phone lock solely in order to use his or her phone on another service. For that reason, although CTIA does not believe a case has been made for an exemption, it would not object to or oppose the targeted class identified at the end of the CTIA conference. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Um, if any of the three of you people proponents have anything to say that is in direct response to anything that Mr. Joseph said, I'll give you two minutes each, but let's confine it to that. I don't want you to start elaborating. I just want you to respond directly if there is anything he said that you had to respond to. Anyone? Sure. <coughs> no, sure. sure. I, yeah, I'll, I can hold it down. I, I just wanted to take a moment to respond um, to the discussion of the story that I told about the event that happened 10 years ago. It is true that at the time, uh, there was not yet an exemption for cell phone unlocking when I unlocked two phones. And um, as a college kid, I was ignorant of the anti-circumvention provision, and I understand that ignorance is no excuse under the law. Um, thankfully, the statute of limitations is 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and I also just wanted to respond briefly to the, to the point about the fair use and 117 arguments. I just wanted to say that it's, it's our position that in this context, Section 117 and, and fair use are both just red herrings. We think that this is a non-infringing use, not because it's fair use, but because it is not infringing to begin with. And that Section 117 is not necessary because this is a non-infringing use, regardless of whether or not the person conducting the mobile device unlocking is in fact an owner of a copy of the software. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, we've discussed that at length in our proposal and comments, but I'd be happy to talk about it more if you have additional questions. Oh, um, 
Yes, and we, we did. Uh, we did, in fact, cite to the poll providing the figures. Um, uh, the the poll that Consumers Union conducted, where national respondents um, stated a strong preference of the ability to take their phones with them from one carrier to another. It, we did not include it as an appendix um, to our comments. However, if if the panel would like to would like to submit questions about that post hearing, we would be happy to respond in writing with um, can we, can we provide a, with a copy of the report. When you cited to it, did you give us a link or anything or did you just refer to it in passing without telling there's, us how to find it? <laughs> sorry, there's there is no link. Uh, there is a there is a footnote <laughs> stating the title of the survey or of the poll. Yes, uh, I, I think I would like to respond just a little bit. Uh, it struck me as uh, how do you measure this uh, collective harm? Uh, and there's millions of consumers that have unlocked their phones and gone to other competitive carriers. Uh, and to uh, fully utilize the device that they pay for, they purchased, uh, they have a fair use of its content uh, that could be truncated or would not. Uh, be fully uh, usable uh, without the unlocking capability. And it sort of struck me that Mr. Joseph didn't assert um, any ev evidentiary material uh, to support his contention that it's non-consequential. I mean, how do you measure the consequences of an individual, of a low-income uh, individual or a handicapped or some disabled, uh, disabled individual who now has access to a handset uh, for nothing other than life-saving purposes how do you measure that as <coughs> consequential? Uh, I don't know that you measure it in terms of dollars. I think you measure it in terms of social benefit uh, to an entire class of people. And if you multiply that by the millions of consumers that have uh, had the opportunity to get full use of their, the products that they've bought, the copyright products that they have on their cell phones that they downloaded and or paid for separately and distinct from the uh, phone itself, then I think you come into the hundreds, if not billions of dollars of harm to consumers if this exemption were not extended. So um, I, I think that in that regard, uh, the non-infringing uh, uh, non act is clearly impaired, i.e. the user non-infringing act. It'd be clearly impaired by the lack of, uh, of having the ability to lock the phones. That is clearly stated in the record. It was stated in page 154 of the registrar's uh, uh, proceedings in 2010. And I think that may have been overlooked by Mr. Joseph Paulson. Uh, if you want the last word, Bruce, before we get to questions, to respond directly to anything that was just said, do you do that now or move on to questions? I, I, I would love to be able to say I don't need the last word, but I, I was struck by Mr. Burry's uh, comments that we haven't proven anything that we've said, and I would emphasize, as the register has emphasized, that the burden of proof is on proponents. I hear references and arguments about low income and disabled individuals. I challenge Mr. Burry to point to any evidence in the record that a prohibition on unlocking wireless devices has in any way, shape, or form harmed low-income or disabled individuals. You know, it's nice to make the argument, but the burden is on the proponents to produce evidence, and there is no evidence. Right, let's, let's go on to questions, um, and I'll start. Um, I get the sense, certainly from CTIA's comments and from what you said today, that it's at least your position <clears throat> that, as compared to the last time we conducted a rulemaking, uh, the availability of unlocked phones is greater than it was at the time of the last rulemaking. If that's wrong, just say it's wrong and I'll stop right there. It is our position, yes, that is our position and more to the point, it is our position that there's even greater evidence in the record, which of course is what you all are working with, that the availability of unlocked phones, including very low price points for those unlocked Okay, can you elaborate a little bit about what the record shows us, Anna? 
if you look at our exhibits uh, A and B, we have examples of hundreds, I believe, of unlocked funds and the prices that they are offered for. And uh, I have just testified, which I, what I believe is a fact, that, uh, that Google is now making unlocked funds available, and that's a matter of public record. We can submit the articles to that effect if that's of interest, and that Apple is now unlocking, for example, And you've already talked about this, and maybe just want to rest on what you've already said, but before I turn to the proponents, I'd just like to give you an opportunity to explain to us what conclusions we should draw from that in terms of where we end up on this particular proposal. And then after you've done that, I'll ask you folks to respond and, and tell us what, A, feel free to accept or attack the factual proposition we just heard from Mr. Joseph, and then secondly, assuming that that factual proposition is correct, I'd like to know what, you, what conclusions you think we should draw from that. Well, with respect to the conclusions, as I said, and I think I did say this already, the burden is on proponents to show substantial harm, and that harm goes beyond inconvenience for some cost, as the register has repeatedly said, for example, in the DVD context. Given that, given the availability of unlocked funds, it also, by the way, goes to the question of whether any claimed harm is the result of a network lock or whether it's the result of a conscious decision made by the consumer to acquire a locked phone as opposed to an unlocked phone, which is freely available. Uh, and under those circumstances, we submit that there is no showing and that the register cannot find that there has been a showing of substantial harm that is due to the prohibition of the circumvention of network locks. Okay, now, any of you talk to the point? So, I'll just briefly talk a little bit about the, the idea that consumers can just easily take and, you know, consumer choice is so great with respect to unlocked phones and they can just switch carriers based on purchasing an unlocked phone. I think uh, Mr. Joseph fails to point out that there are other restrictions that consumers face, such as um, early termination fees, long-term contracts, and so this is just one, this is just another way to lock con consumers into a particular carrier. And we've seen that consumers do purchase their devices based on the carrier that it's tied to, and so sometimes you have, you have exclusive contracts. Previously, the iPhone was an exclusive contract, and so the ability to take a phone with a consumer, we believe, is an important choice that you know, we may not be able to quantify how many consumers are doing it, but we don't know whether or not the unlocked phones that are available are phones that people actually want. They may not be smartphones, they may be feature phones. So I think the idea that you know giving consumers some locked phones, some unlocked phones is enough, I don't think for us is really um, giving consumers a choice. We think consumers should have a choice regardless of um, who carries a phone and you know, they may actually want one of the locked phones and take it with them to a cheaper carrier. I think what I might have heard you saying, and I just want to make sure I get clarification here, are you suggesting that even with respect to some of the unlocked phones, you're still stuck with early termination fees and, mm -hmm. and, and term commitments? Bruce, do you know if that's, if that's the case? Uh, it is true that if you acquire a phone pursuant to a long-term commitment, pursuant to a contract, and as a result, the phone, there, there are some carriers, for example, that will subsidize phones that aren't locked. Okay. Verizon Wireless comes okay. to mind. They use other means to protect the subsidy interest, but that doesn't mean that the lock isn't also a valid means of protecting the interest that was related to the development of that phone in the first instance. And this brings us back to perhaps the business model versus other questions, which I think is different than what the focus of your question is, which goes to harm. But in some cases, the consumer opts to enter into a contract. In other cases, the consumer doesn't opt to enter into a contract. In the case of prepaid phones, which by the way also extend beyond the basic telephones, uh, the consumer doesn't have a contract. There is no contractual provision, there is no early termination. You just lose the server, you just stop. Uh, and if the phone was subsidized, only the network block exists as a means to ensure that the carrier, that the phone isn't 
purchased and the subsidy is installed for other uses. But coming back to the question of harm, uh, if these other, again, it's the proponents <coughs> to demonstrate that the harm is due to network lock, and if it's the proponent's testimony now that the harm is actually due to these other factors, then they've actually undermined it. That sounds like a good point. Can you explain why the termination fees and the commitments make any difference whatsoever in the case of a phone that is not locked? How, why is that pertinent to what we're here about? some assertions, but I'm not quite sure how categorical they are, whether they're exceptions, but an impression that I get from what I've read and heard from CTIA, and I'm not necessarily saying that's what you're saying, I'm saying it's an impression I get, is that once the contractual commitment is up, as a general proposition, the carriers will unlock the phone, but maybe that's not always, I don't know, but if, to the extent any of you can help me on that, that's pertinent to the point you just made, so. Well, I think so. Question is directed to the impression you get from our comments. I believe that is a correct impression. That once the contract is up, as a general matter, but not as a ubiquitous universal, uh, you know, in all cases, the carrier will unlock the phone. Uh, as uh, our comments make clear, that there are certain cases where there's the carriers have invested in the development of the phone and the software, and as part of the inducement to do that, they have. A distribution agreement, and there are at least it was my understanding that there were at least some carriers, or there was at least one carrier that up to a point did not unlock phones for which they were the exclusive distributor. They had, because of the investments that they had made in bringing that phone and its functional software, which is a copyright interest, to in the market. Now, I say that with a major caveat, and that is. I have some reason to believe, and I'd like to check on this for the record, I just don't know as I sit here, that the policy of that carrier with respect to unlocking the iPhone now actually extends beyond the iPhone to other phones. I just don't know that for sure as I sit here, so I don't want to misrepresent anything. Okay, then please do follow up on that for us. If, uh, if I may yeah. have an opportunity. Uh, first, on, on the harm. I, I go back to the, the record is replete with the harm, the, the terminating a right of consumer on a non-infringing act is in fact uh, harm, and that will in fact be truncated or terminated. Access to the, uh, the consumer to the content which they pay for and is housed on that device is in fact uh, a right that's being truncated and it's in, in many instances I think most people would say they don't have access to the information on the firm that their phone, their personal phone, that is in fact a severe, uh, you know, uh, impairment of their expectations for that device. Uh, going to the question you asked originally, is uh, are there other carriers? Uh, excuse me, are there uh, devices that are being unlocked? Uh, yes, there are more devices now than there were uh, three years ago. 
but uh, I would presume, I would say that without your acts, without the act of the registrar providing this unlocking provision, there is a high probability that, that there would not be any unlocked phones by the largest carriers that dominate the O&M, the, uh, the manufacturers with the handsets. I think your policy of allowing unlocked phones has actually changed the marketplace and changed the wireless carrier's expectations. My carriers distinguish themselves on the ability for personal service to customers. That's why they're willing to take the time, effort, energy to allow uh, other devices from other carriers to come on their network uh, and they service that, that customer. Uh, without the unlocking provision, I think you would uh, uh, lessen competition. We would have fewer opportunities for our smaller carriers to distinguish themselves in the market and customers and consumers, especially consumers, would have fewer choices and they would have less benefits. I don't know that you would have unlocked devices uh, from the larger carriers had you not made the decision originally to say this is in fact a right that consumers should in fact have. Now whether you want to measure harm by an empirical uh, you know, study, uh, it, it, and I understand the, the shift of the burden here, but what I suggested to Mr. Joseph is he suggested that there were no consequential uh, uh, um, evidence of, of harm. You can't just make a statement without also being able to support it. And just like he's expecting of us, I can say that there's millions of consumers right now on my carriers' networks that have devices that they have unlocked and brought to our network. That they have benefited economically from that because they have not had to purchase another device. And they have enjoyed full use of content and they did, in fact, uh, be, uh, were able to, to, to act on a non-infringing act, i.e. take their phone to another carrier. Those are all well documented in, uh, in the record of 2010 and I think the record of, uh, uh, that's currently before you. So I, 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 I take issue with that, but I, I really believe that you've had a greater impact than you may think on the issue of are there unlocked devices on the market today. And I think your actions, in fact, have contributed greatly to that industry policy or practice of unlocking phones. And I disagree that there, there are carriers that unlock phones, but there are carriers, large carriers, that do not un unlock all the phones and will not unlock all the phones that you're requested by a consumer to unlock. Right, and if I can just add a couple points. We did detail the publicly available unlocking policies of a few carriers in our Wi-Fi comments. However, there, we were completely unable to find a publicly available unlocking policy for Sprint. So I, I don't know, maybe maybe there is one, but I, I was unable to find it. Um, and, and there are a number of terrible limitations on these unlocking policies. For example, T-Mobile will only unlock one phone for a customer every 90 days or more. So if I have if I have two unused old T-Mobile phones sitting in a drawer and I'd like to give them to friends, I have to wait 90 days between unlocking them uh, if I want to go to T-Mobile to do a phone. And another thing is that I can't give my phone to um, to a friend who's not a T-Mobile subscriber and have that person go to T-Mobile to get it unlocked. I have to do it myself as the T-Mobile customer, um, and someone who's not a customer certainly can't go to the
no evidence to support causation. You have a coincidence in time. You have many other factors at play. And I think the fact that there's no instance of a carrier ever suing a customer for unlocking their phone for connection on the network, which is what was within the scope of the exemption, shows that the fact of the exemption used narrowly has not been what has caused the carriers to unlock their phones. There's just no evidence of that. Okay, one final question on this topic, then we'll move on. So, excuse me, the record shows that there are certainly a wide number of devices that are available in unlocked form. Can anyone identify any particular devices that are not available in an unlocked form and that have features or that for some reason a consumer would want to have that device in particular unlocked as opposed to some other device that is out there in an unlocked form? I don't know if that's made myself clear, but the point basically being there are all sorts of alternatives apparently for unlocked devices. Why, if a particular model isn't available in unlocked form, does that make a difference? I would, in the Metro PCS filing, there is a statement in there. I don't think any of the exclusive devices that AT&T has in its portfolio are unlocked. There are other ways to restrict access to the phone.